Hi, I'm Mark Tyrrell of Uncommon Knowledge, and welcome to the Psychology of Persuasion and how to inoculate yourself against manipulation. Why I believe everyone should understand Cialdini's six principles of influence. So how is it that some people and some situations can persuade us so much more than others? How persuadable you are is partly to do with the state that you're in. If you're tired or hungry or lonely or especially needy in some other way, then you're likely to become more persuadable. You can get a desperately thirsty man to do almost anything if you promise him a glass of water. So making sure that your primal emotional and physical needs are satisfactorily met in your life makes you less easily prey to being conned by people who seem to promise to meet these needs but want too much in return. Someone or something that seems to meet an emotional need within you will seem very persuasive to you. You might think you would uh, notice when someone is trying to persuade you about something, but some of these needs are quite subtle and we're not always conscious of our drive to meet them. Psychologist Robert uh, Cialdini describes six principles of persuasion and makes the point that being persuaded is not in and of itself necessarily a bad thing. If you can persuade someone to wear a safety belt in a car or not to drink and drive, that's obviously a good use of persuasion. But when we consider some of the awful things that um, people, sometimes millions of people, have been persuaded to do by charismatic leaders, we can see that understanding the psychology of persuasion is important, perhaps even vital, for all our sakes. So the first principle is reciprocity. When someone does something for us, we feel obliged to do something back for them even if we don't consciously realize this. We say we're much obliged, obligated, when someone does something for us, or I owe you one. So someone who's trying to persuade me of something might use this principle by doing something, even a very small something, for me first. This accounts for the widespread use of the free sample in marketing. Cialdini cites the example of Ethiopia providing thousands of dollars in humanitarian aid to Mexico just after the 1985 earthquake, although Ethiopia was itself suffering from a crippling famine and civil war at the time. Ethiopia was reciprocating for the diplomatic support that Mexico provided when Italy invaded Ethiopia way back in 1935. So the good cop, bad cop principle also relies on wanting to please the guy who's being nice to you. Of course, people do nice things for others all the time without necessarily wanting anything in return. But remember that in most people, the feeling of being beholden to someone because they've done something for you is a powerful influencer. Two, self-consistency. The second principle of persuasion is self-consistency. So Cialdini found that people who commit uh, orally or in writing to some idea or goal are more likely to uphold that idea or strive for that goal because the act of commitment establish it, establishes it as a congruent uh, part of their self-image. Okay, Even when the original incentive or motivation is removed, after they've given their agreement, they'll continue to honor it quite often. Publicly stating something works because we like to present a consistent image of ourselves to the world and also to ourselves. If you role play, um, being someone who believes something that you don't believe to start with, you can become more sympathetic to that idea, even though you know you're role playing. The term brainwashing derives from a Chinese expression whose quite literal meaning means to wash the brain. During the Korean War, brainwashing became a term understood in the West, and it slowly became clear as time went on that a number of American prisoners of the Chinese who were asked to repeatedly read out anti-American and pro-communist ideas to their fellow prisoners had gradually begun to adopt similar beliefs themselves. The principle at work here is along the lines of, I must believe it, else why did I say it? Even if you've been made to say it. People who join in with bullying often do so because the lead bully 
has first got them to join in with doing small unkindnesses to the bully victim. Their self-image thus becomes aligned with doing what he does. So when he switches from kindness to unkindness and sets the bullying bandwagon rolling, they have to keep on bullying alongside in order to stay consistent with doing what he does. Don't underestimate the power of the need to feel and be consistent. As a great Rolf Waldo Emerson wrote, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds, adored by little statesmen and philosophers and divines. With consistency, a great soul has simply nothing to do. He may as well concern himself with the shadows on the wall. Speak what you think now in hard words, and tomorrow speak what tomorrow thinks in hard words again, though it contradict everything you said today. So those are wise words from Emerson. Three, social proof. Next, we have the power of social proof. We are herd creatures in many ways, and a million people can't be wrong. If others are doing it, you should too. How many people would really wear low-slung underwear revealing jeans if no one else was doing it? People will do things they see other people doing. Testimonials are powerful because of the principle of social proof. Okay. Of course, sometimes there are perfectly good reasons why lots of people doing something uh, might be a good idea. But there's also the so-called madness of crowds, our tendency to do or believe something just because lots of other people are doing or believing it. A tendency that can stop us thinking for ourselves and be manipulated on a large scale. Four, perceived authority. So fourth comes perceived authority. It must be good because scientists say it's good, or a teacher says so, or the king says so, or uh, the police say so, or you know, uh, some expert. But the dark side of this is the I was just following all his excuse given by ex-Nazis asked to explain their actions. Stanley Milgram's famous experiments in the 1960s plainly showed that normal people can be made to carry out highly objectionable and very cruel acts because of the universal principle of blindly responding to perceived authority. The problem is that authority is very easily faked by simply putting on appropriate trappings, a uniform or a certain manner of speech or behavior, and we all fall for it. Once again, we hand over the responsibility of thinking for ourselves to someone with a badge. Five, likability. The fifth principle on the face of it doesn't seem particularly sinister. You know, I'm talking about the principle of liking. Likeable people can be extremely persuasive. It's been found, not surprisingly, that we're more likely to buy from someone we like. You know, salespeople are often attractive and likable. Okay, they're agreeable personalities. If they try too hard, they can come across as smarmy, but if we genuinely like someone, then we can be more easily persuaded. How many people, after being conned, say stuff like, but he seems so nice? And physically attractive people are universally assumed to be more likable, cleverer, braver, and more moral than plainer folk. This is called the halo effect. The problem is that even perfectly likable people don't necessarily have your best interests at heart. Scarcity, number six. Now the last principle in the power of persuasion I'm going to uh, talk about is the scarcity principle. So we all understand that if diamonds grew on trees and littered the ground, nobody would think much about them or value them particularly highly. What makes them so valuable is their relative scarcity. There just aren't that many of them around. Now, how many salespeople have you heard tell you things like, we can only hold these prices until Monday, or you can only get these items while stocks last, or you can only get this from me and only today. The implication is that they're they are, or they soon will be, scarce, and so you perceive them as more valuable to you. But this principle goes deeper and affects more of our experience of life than we might think. So, for example, if, so if someone's moody and grumpy and disagreeable a lot of the time, we can fall into the trap of feeling unduly and pathetically grateful when they occasionally demonstrate a shred of pleasantness and decency. Their nice behavior becomes a lot more valuable to us than the um, always on, ta on tap nice behavior of someone who's more readily cheerful and pleasant most of the time. Okay. 
You value the pleasantness of someone who's unpleasant. Behavioral psychologist B.F. Skinner found that inconsistent and therefore scarce rewards are a lot more addictive and compulsive. So for example, cats who were not always rewarded with food after certain behaviors behaved more compulsively than those that always got rewarded with food. So believe it or not, gambling would be less compulsive if people always won. Maybe drug addicts would feel freer if they always scored rather than only sometimes scored. It's the scarcity that makes it compulsive, the hunting. Maybe the woman who goes back time and time again to the abusive, violent, unpredictable lover is addicted to the good times because of their scarcity rather than someone who's always pleasant and nice to them. So be aware and beware when people are consciously or unconsciously using the scarcity principle on you. So to recap, the six principles of persuasion I've described are uh, reciprocity, self-consistency, social proof, authority, liking, and scarcity. Pay attention and don't let yourself be persuaded just because you were under the influence of one or more of these principles. There might be other good reasons to be persuaded, but not just because of these principles. So I hope you found that useful, and if you did, please hit like and subscribe. And if you want to hear when my next video is published, hit the notification bell below. I'm Mark Turrell of Uncommon Knowledge, and if you'd like to subscribe to my email newsletter, you can find it over at unk.com slash blog. That's unk.com slash blog. And thanks for watching. Thank you.